Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're gonna do a review of an iPhone Bluetooth controller. This is the Scuf Nomad. Now I've been an iPhone user forever since 2008 with the iPhone 3G. And it might surprise you to find that about half of Americans are primarily iPhone users as well. Now I think a lot of people would agree that gaming on an iPhone is still kind of a mixed bag, which is surprising given the fact that these phones have been around for almost 20 years at this point. Now things have improved a lot when it comes to emulation because now officially apps like Delta and RetroArch are available on the App Store, and that's a pretty big deal. In fact, I made an entire setup guide for RetroArch on the iPhone. If you haven't seen it already, I'll leave it linked down below. And so while I would say that gaming on the iPhone is definitely not perfect, it's never been better than it is right now. And I think it's a great time to actually try out a new controller because we haven't seen a lot of innovation in the iPhone space in particular. I would say up until this point, the most popular controller has been the Backbone One, and I actually really enjoy this, but it is several years old. In addition, I feel like some of its features are a little bit lacking and it also has a subscription service if you want to get the most out of the platform, which has always rubbed me the wrong way. So I do think it is time to look at all the different controllers that we can use. And thankfully, because iPhones are moving towards USB-C, that does mean that we'll have more options available that were previously only available for Android. Now, the Scuf Nomad is a little bit different in that regard because this is a Bluetooth controller. And paradoxically, it's only meant to be used with an iPhone. So even if you had an Android device, you wanted to use it with Bluetooth, it is not designed for this. This is strictly for or Apple phones. But I think there are a lot of unique aspects to this controller that are worth investigating, including symmetrical sticks up above like the Wii U controller, but then also the ability to customize the back paddles as well as the thumbstick and trigger sensitivity. And so in this video, I wanna focus on whether or not these features are gonna push it past the Backbone One and make it justify that $99 price point. On top of that, I wanna investigate whether or not a Bluetooth controller is gonna be best for you. There are some advantages like the ability to use just about any case with it, but then also there are some disadvantages like the inability to have pass-through charging. So even though, yes, this is a review of the Scuf Nomad controller, I also just kind of want to look at what Apple gaming is like right now on an iPhone today. And so, as you can imagine, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Grab a snack and drink and let's go ahead and get started. Okay, as we get started, a quick disclosure. So this was sent over by Scuff for review, but all opinions are my own. No money was exchanged in any way, and they're not seeing this video ahead of time. Now, the box itself is relatively small and pretty typical. You know, it just has a couple of the features on the outside, and that's about it. Now, inside is where all the fun stuff happens. So we have a warranty as well as a couple other accessories, and then, of course, the controller itself, which, interestingly enough, is wrapped in a bunch of paper. Let's take a look at those accessories first. So inside a little box, we have two additional thumb caps. And these ones are a little bit different from the stock ones directly on the controller. To start, they are not concave at all, unlike the others. And then also one is taller than the other. So if you wanted to have more precise controls, this is what you would use to switch out with. And switching them out is super simple. You can just pop the old one off and then pop the new one on. It does take a little bit of elbow grease just to figure out the correct way to snap it on. But once you get used to it, it's very easy. And so here's a look at the raised thumb stick. It's a little bit high for my taste, but it's nice that they included it in the package. For me personally, I like these stock grips. They have a nice grippy texture around the outside, and then also they are concave in the center, which just fits my thumbs really easily. Okay, moving along, the next accessory is a six foot long USB-A to USB-C cable. And then finally, we have this small piece of rubber. And so this is supposed to be if you have an iPhone 14 or 15 with a large camera bump on it. The idea here is you can put that rubber piece on the shelf here on the bottom of the controller. This allows you to put the phone a little bit higher up so that way the camera bump isn't going to be pressing against the actual controller itself. And so if you have an iPhone 14 or 15 or what I assume is also going to be on the 16, this is going to allow you to be able to get that clearance. However, over the last week or so of testing, I've come to prefer not using this rubber bumper and instead just kind of going raw with putting the phone directly in its slot. Yes, that means the camera bump will make the left side stick out a little bit, but it still feels very secure. And so I've just preferred to play it this way. Regardless, I appreciate the fact that they give you the choice by including it in the box. Now, first impressions as I hold the controller in my hand, two things really stand out to me. The first is that it feels really grippy and ergonomic. I've never actually used a controller from Scuf before, but I know they've been around forever and they make like competitive controllers. And it really shows with just the overall feel of this controller. It feels like it's made by a company who's been doing this a long time. 
I also like how comfortable it is to rest my thumbs directly on the sticks, because they're right there. It's like a really comfortable position. So yeah, overall, really impressed by the overall grip and premium feel of this controller. And then the second thing that really stood out to me is that it feels really sturdy as well. Most of the controllers that are in this space I would consider to be relatively flimsy, but this one is definitely not that. So before we jump into things like ergonomics in the field, let's talk a bit more about each of the components. Let's start by talking about the analog sticks, and like I mentioned, I like the grippiness of the overall thumbsticks, but I also appreciate the fact that these are full-size thumbsticks. They're also hull sensors, if that's important for you too. The biggest thing that stands out for me when playing around with these is that it just feels so much more fluid and full compared to others within the same space. I think the best example is to show off gameplay from Super Mario 64. Now this is a game that really is reliant on analog inputs, and I gotta say that using this controller kinda makes me feel like a little bit of a superstar. In that I mean that Mario basically goes exactly where I want him to go depending on where I move that stick around, and so I feel like I have just more nuanced control when playing with this controller compared to most others. It's a really small difference to discern, but I think that if you were to actually try it out you would probably feel the same difference. It's like I can just move around like any of the obstacles I need to perfectly, and that's not something that will usually happen, especially with like retro handhelds that use switch style inputs. And so already from a controls perspective, I feel like this is winning me over. And not only do these sticks feel great out of the box, but within the Nomad app, you can actually change the preset however you would like. You have four different response types presets that you can work around with, and you can also set these on a per game basis within the app, and so there's a lot of room for creativity within here. Now the second observation I had about these sticks is one that I'm a little bit mixed on, and it basically is the fact that this is a very stick-centered controller. By that I mean that your thumbs will just naturally rest where the sticks are, to the point where it feels almost unnatural to move them away from the sticks so that you can reach down for the d-pad or the face buttons. In fact, when playing first-person shooter games like Destiny 2, this is something I had to adapt to, and so instead of using the face buttons to like reload or to jump, I ended up mapping those to the back buttons instead. And this is all done within the app as well, and you can change out any button. It doesn't have to be just those back bumpers, you can change any to your liking. Personally, I didn't change out anything but just the back bumpers, and I changed them to be the reload and jump buttons within Destiny 2. And once I had done that, it made it a lot easier of an experience. This is very similar to what I've done with like an Xbox Elite controller, and so it felt pretty natural to have this kind of setup, and it was nice to not have to reach down and press those face buttons, and so I could keep my thumb on the right analog stick. And so that is something to keep in mind, is that this is an analog stick centered controller, which again makes sense because I think the target audience is probably people who are playing things like competitive shooters. Either way, the sticks themselves feel great, they also do click down L3 and R3. Let's go ahead and move on and start talking about the D-pad, and this surprisingly is also very good. At first glance it looks like an Xbox Series controller, but it actually is more like a Sega controller. It has a rubber membrane connection to it, a little bit on the mushy side, but still very tactile and responsive. And first two observations is that the D-pad is relatively small in the grand scheme of things, but it is very precise. In fact, it passes my Contra test really easily. I can press down on the D-pad and then rock it left and right just slightly, and the character will stay where they are. But if I want to push it a little bit more to each side to the extreme angles, then yes, it will move the character. And this is just about perfect for me when it comes to a D-pad. I want the ability to hit a diagonal if I want to, but not when I don't. And that's exactly what's happening here with this controller. And so just in terms of precision, I would give this D-pad probably a 9 or a 10 out of 10. It is that good. For most of the other controllers within this type of phone controller space, most of the controls can be described as getting the job done, in the fact that maybe the D-pad and analog sticks aren't terrible, but they still aren't something that I would write home about. This is the opposite effect. I would say that this goes well beyond just working to the point where it's enjoyable, and that is very rare with these types of controllers. Now one other observation I want to make about the D-pad is that D-pad centric gaming is still very good on this controller, but it does require you to hold your hands in a little bit different of a position compared to playing with something with the analog sticks. So let's take a look again at some Destiny 2 footage. You can see how high my thumbs are altogether. That's so that I can reach the triggers and shoulder buttons with ease. Now when it comes to playing a platformer or something 
thing where I'm playing with just the D-pad and the face buttons, it also feels good, but I do have to shift my hands down just a little bit. It still does allow me to access the shoulders and triggers, but they're not the primary inputs for these type of games. And so I find this to be equally comfortable, but just takes a little bit of a shift. The only time that it really becomes an issue is when you're trying to go back and forth between the two while playing the same game. So I think for both stick-centric as well as D-pad-centric games, they are equally good, but you're not going to want to play a game that really mixes the two, which is relatively rare anyway. At the end of the day, I'm a big fan of both of these two control schemes, between the D-pad as well as the analog sticks. I think they did a really good job here. Let's take a look at the rest of the face button. So on the bottom are the select and start buttons. That might look a little bit weird, but you have to remember what's up top. So on the left on the top, we have our home button. And then on the right, we have a scuff button for things like video capture, stuff like that. Now, I actually prefer this control scheme. Since the analog sticks are up top, it actually makes it a little bit hard to hit the home button and the scuff buttons. And so I actually prefer to be able to reach down and press select and start when needed. It's a lot easier. So I think from a design point, it's actually pretty good. Next, let's take a look at these face buttons. So they are a rubber membrane connection, but are nice and tight and responsive. The size on them is a little bit small. I would say they're pretty close to something like a Steam Deck's buttons, but still, I think they work really well. And so again, I think that Scuff did a really good job with these face buttons too. I'm having a hard time finding anything to complain about with this controller, which is a really good thing. Let's move on to these shoulders and triggers and see if we can find any problems here. And unfortunately, I'm here to report that these are just fine too. The triggers are a little bit shallow in the amount of travel, but otherwise, feel really smooth and nice. Much like with the analog sticks, you have four different presets to work with as well. In fact, they have these same names as before. The default preset is aggressive, and I found that this actually works really well because it makes it a lot more responsive. So this is what I've been using in my own setup as well. I'd love to see maybe a hair trigger option within the software, but otherwise, yeah, I've got no complaints here either. Next, let's move on to the bumpers. These are also equally good. One thing I really like about them is that they are super quiet. They are almost silent, and so I really like that. They're a little bit harder to press down than I would like, but I bet they would soften over time. So I think the overall design, including the shoulders and triggers, as well as the sticks and buttons, everything just feels really good, and I think it's well designed. It's definitely more focused on modern and analog stick centric games, but I don't think it's a bad thing either, especially if those are the type of games you plan on playing. And finally, let's talk about the back. So two things that I'm not super hot on. Number one is the design on the back with these grips. From a texture standpoint, I think they're great. They're a little bit rubberized and feel really nice and grippy in the hand, but I'm not really sure about this design. It almost looks like a snake skin, and I don't know, I just don't really like that with my controller. However, I can totally recognize that that is just a nitpick and a personal preference. The bumpers themselves work pretty well. They're a little bit on the hard side to press down on, which I think is a good thing if you don't want to hit them accidentally, but I think they could be a little bit more on the softer side. Either way, it did not take me long to adjust to how hard I needed to press down on them. Okay, a couple other design notes before we move on. I also really like the texture and the design here on the front. This is a little bit rubberized, but very textured, and so it makes me feel like my phone is well secured in place, so I do like that. And finally, this one is kind of weird, but I really love opening and closing this controller. Now, there are a lot of other telescopic controllers that can do this, but I've never felt any as satisfying as this one. Somehow, they were able to make it so that I could open up this controller without feeling like it's getting any more flimsy, and so it's equally as sturdy as when I'm opening it up and when I'm closing it. Not only that, it just has a really smooth feel to it as you open and close it, and so, I don't know, I just find this really satisfying, and so I do appreciate this little touch as well. And then finally on the bottom, we've got a USB-C charging port. And then also on the right of that, we have our Bluetooth pairing button if you need to repair your controller. Next, let's move on and talk a little bit about size so you can get an idea of how big this is going to be in your hands. We'll start with the Backbone one. Like I mentioned before, this is probably one of the more popular iPhone controllers out there today. And I think it's pretty clear that the Backbone is quite a bit smaller, especially when it comes to length, but then also in the thickness and just overall heft. And this can really be a good or a bad thing, depending on your preference. For me, I like the fact that it's kind of lightweight and I can take it around anywhere, but then also it feels exceptionally flimsy compared to the other. Not only that, the, you know, the buttons themselves, like I mentioned before, they just get the job done. So they're all very clicky and not very precise, but you know, if you're in a pinch and you want to play a game, this isn't that bad of a choice. It's a very similar story with the Razer Kishi version 2, which I kind of think is a ripoff of the Backbone 1. This thing is equally lightweight and a little bit on the flimsy side and also extremely clicky. And so if you like that feeling of having something small and clicky in your hands, it's not that terrible of an experience, but I just would prefer something like the Scuff Nomad myself. 
It's almost like the Backbone and the Kishi just have a series of compromises to get it to a smaller size, whereas the Nomad really found a better balance where it's like, okay, this is going to be a little bit bigger, but man, it's going to feel a lot better. Another controller with a similar ethos would be the Gamesur G8 Galileo. I've talked about this one a lot. It's one of my favorite telescopic controllers in this space. And yeah, this one feels super roomy and doesn't feel like a compromise. In fact, it really just feels like an Xbox controller that's been split in half with this space in the center. And so really no shade with the G8 Galileo. I think it's a great controller. It comes in at a good price too. It's $80 instead of $99 like the Scuf Nomad. But along those same lines, this one is quite a bit larger feeling. It's like holding a Steam Deck versus something smaller like an ROG Ally. And when directly comparing between the two, I would say the game sir feels quite a bit more cheap than the premium feel of the Scuf Nomad. So to wrap everything up, I would say that the Scuf Nomad is definitely not a small form factor controller, but not like an exceptionally large one either. I think they did a pretty good job of finding a good balance here. And man, it feels really good to hold in the hands as well, especially when playing analog stick centric games. Now, given that this is such a roomy feeling controller, one of the things you have to bear in mind is that it is not very portable either. For example, this is not something that I would be comfortable with throwing in a pocket. Even if I'm wearing like shorts that have larger pockets, it's just kind of big and ungainly. Instead, I would say this is something that you would want to throw in a backpack or take around with you in your carry on luggage when going on a flight, you know, things like that. So let me give you an idea of what the overall size is when we're talking about actually connecting it to a phone. So here's a comparison with the Odin 2 as well as my Scuf Nomad with my iPhone 15 non-max edition. And you can see here that the Scuf Nomad is a little bit larger, but not by much. But to be honest, I think that for most games, especially those with analog sticks, I would rather play them on the Scuf Nomad than even the Odin 2. And to give you one more size comparison, here's the ROG Ally X. So yeah, this thing is quite a bit smaller than typical handheld PCs, but it is going to be quite large depending on the size of your phone. Long story short, this is a controller that prioritizes comfort over portability. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about setup with this controller and then we'll start talking about the games and what I recommend. To start, this is an iPhone 15 Pro non-Mac. So if you've got a Max version of this phone, it might be a little bit of a different fit. And I'm just using a standard Apple case that I picked up when I first bought my phone. Now this will work with any iPhone, starting with iPhone 8 all the way up to present day. And setting it up will be exactly the same. You'll go into your Bluetooth settings and then press and hold the home button for a couple seconds and then you'll see it popping up here on the bottom. After that, just tap on it and you'll be connected. From there, I recommend going into the App Store and picking up the Scuf Nomad app. This is going to be free and it has no subscription service like the Backbone one. Now the app can do multiple things. For example, it can act as a launcher. So if you wanted to put certain games within your home screen, you can launch them directly from here. And they have a whole section about recommended games and you can install them directly from this menu as well. Further down in the menu, you have the ability to launch directly into Apple Arcade or even pull up PlayStation Remote Play. And it does sound like they are gonna be adding extra launchers here later as well. There's also a gallery section for all of your screenshots and video captures if you use that scuff button on the top right. Now within the menu, we have the ability to adjust our options. This includes multiple different profiles for different people. And this is where you would adjust things like your buttons and your triggers and all that other stuff we talked about earlier. Also within this setting, you can do things like update to the latest firmware, and then you can also adjust how long it'll take before the controller times out. Also within here, you can manage all the various profiles you can set up per game. Like I mentioned before, if you have a certain game where you want to have a certain control scheme to it, you can make that customization and then adjust it within here. And then finally, you can also adjust your recording settings from here as well. Okay, now that we've kind of figured out everything about this controller, let's actually start talking about playing games and all the various ways you can do that. And in this section, I want to break it down by various sources, including things like emulation, as well as apps directly from the App Store, and then various subscription services. So let's start by just going into the App Store and then browsing through and then picking up games from here, just like we have over the past 15, almost 20 years. And as you can imagine, most of these more popular games are going to be very lightweight and casual games that wouldn't even require a controller. That's just kind of how these app stores are. However, there are quite a few games that work really well with controllers, so let's really focus on that in this video. And even though controller-supported games are a little bit of a minority compared to the rest within the App Store, I think there are still a lot of great games here. And the nice thing is that many of these are free with additional in-app purchases depending on how involved you want to get into the game. And I think that's a perfect setup because for the most part, 
I like to just jump into these casually in the sense that I just kind of pick it up for a few minutes when I'm bored, but I may not be ready to commit to actually spending some money on them. So this is kind of a perfect balance for me. A great example would be something like Diablo Immortal, which has cloud saving. And so you're able to just kind of jump in when you want to play a little bit and then jump right out. I think my favorite among all of this category of games that I tested had to be Call of Duty Warzone. Again, this is a free to play game where you can spend money if you'd like, but it's just a perfect casual experience for me as well. For me personally, I like to just play in training mode. That allows me to play for about five or 10 minutes in each match. And I'm pretty sure I'm playing against bots, but I don't really care. It actually feels really satisfying to be able to wipe the floor with everyone. And so that's a really great mixture of casual gaming for free using a controller like this. Another good example is going to be one that just came out. It's called Zenless Zone Zero. So this is made by the same people that made Genshin Impact. And this one also has full controller support. You do have to go into the options and actually enable it. But after that, even from the very beginning, you'll be able to control with a controller. And this one is also a free to play game, but of course I'm sure it has in-app purchases. Now, one new addition to the whole iOS ecosystem is that they've been putting AAA games on the App Store for about a year at this point. And we're talking about full console games here, like the Resident Evil series, as well as stuff like Alien Isolation. And there's a couple things to know about this whole experience as well. Number one, it's pretty amazing that you can play these console ported games directly on a phone like this. Sure, the graphics are going to be a little bit worse, but on a small screen like this, I don't really notice. In fact, I have to keep reminding myself that I'm not playing something that's streaming over the internet, but this is actually playing on my phone. It's kind of crazy. And I think it's a pretty cool opportunity for people who perhaps don't have a console at home or maybe don't have a gaming PC, but they still want to play one of these more modern games. So I think that's pretty cool. And all these games have a similar model in that you can play for quite some time before they actually ask you to pay for it. And so it's one of those things where you can demo it out figure out whether or not it's going to be a good fit for you and whether or not you want to invest into it, and then you can choose to purchase it from there. However, that also leads to one other big caveat in that these games are quite expensive, even compared to the console and PC counterparts. And you can see their pricing by going into the App Store, clicking on the game, and then scrolling down and then selecting the in-app purchases option. So for example, with Resident Evil 4 Remake, they are asking a full $60 for the base game and then an additional $20 for the DLC. So we're looking at $80 if you want to fully experience everything you can within this game. Now it just so happens that Steam is running a summer sale right now, and if you wanted to buy this exact same game on PC, it would only cost you $30 right now, so it's half the price. And even then, at full retail, it's only $40, so it's still even cheaper just normally. On top of that, if you wanted to buy the gold version, which includes the DLC, that's only going to be $40 altogether, at least right now. Now let's take a look at another one. This is Resident Evil Village. The base game for this is $40 and an additional $20 for DLC, so upwards of $60. Same thing here, if we wanted to buy this on Steam, it's going to be $16 for the base game and then $20 for everything, including the DLC. Not only that, you could buy Resident Evil 7 and Village right now with all the DLC for $30 for both games. And so there is definitely a big price difference between the two, even when we don't factor in the retail prices and the sales that you will often find in Steam as well as on the consoles. And I've heard these games are not selling well on iOS, and I think it's pretty easy to see why. Not only does it cost more than the console and PC counterparts, but then also people within the iOS ecosphere are not used to paying that much for a game at all. We just talked about all the games that were free and how great of an experience that is, and here we are talking about games that can cost upwards of $80 if you want to get the game and the DLC. So in the end, I'm not surprised that these games aren't doing well, but I think it would be a lot more interesting of a prospect if they ever get to be at least on par price-wise with the PC and console counterparts. Okay, next up I want to talk about Apple Arcade. So this is a subscription service provided by Apple that is $7 a month. And you can also get it as part of the Apple One plan, which starts at $20 a month and it'll include things like Apple TV and Apple Music, as well as additional iCloud storage. Now my family actually does use Apple One, and so we use the middle tier, $26 a month. That gives everybody Apple Music and Apple TV, which a lot of people in my family like, and then I also can try out Apple Arcade from time to time. Now much like with the regular App Store, Apple Arcade is dominated by very casual games that mostly will not require a controller. To give you an idea, the number one app on Apple Arcade is Solitaire, so this is a very casually minded ecosystem. Now to be fair, some of these games are pretty fun. I enjoy Dononpachi Resurrection HD+, 
It's a very simple game. It just automatically fires the weapon. So all you have to do is just move the plane around. Regardless, it's a quick and fun and easy way of playing some games. Although I don't really think this is going to be worth $7 a month for Apple Arcade. Now, one trick you can do is when scrolling through games in Apple Arcade, if you go all the way down to the bottom, there's an option to see all games. From there, you can add a filter to include games that have controller support. This will make things a lot easier to use. And once you set that filter, you will see that there is pretty slim pickings when it comes to controller supported games within Apple Arcade. Usually it's only about one or two games a month, and that's about it. And so I would not say that you could probably rely on only controller supported games within Apple Arcade to really get your money's worth. And so for me, the Apple Arcade ecosystem only really makes sense if you're going to buy it as part of the larger Apple One system, if you do plan on using both Apple TV as well as Apple Arcade, or maybe a little bit of extra iCloud storage. And there are quite a few games that are unique or really high quality within Apple Arcade. A very easy example would be NBA 2K24, and I think it was the same with 23 and 22 as well. These have all been very Apple Arcade-centric games. And I got to say that these look and play amazing. It's pretty crazy to be able to play something like this on a phone. There are other games that are exclusive to iOS that you actually cannot find on Android. That includes things like Horizon Chase 2, as well as Shovel Knight Dig. And I assume this is because these publishers have some sort of deal with Apple, so they're not showing up on the Google Play Store. But either way, it is pretty neat to be able to have access to these games. So in the end, I would say that yes, there are quite a few options available within Apple Arcade, but not enough to justify that full $7 a month, at least for me. But if you do plan on getting a larger package, which includes TV and music, then yeah, I think it makes a little bit more sense. And if we're not just talking about controller-centered games, but if you want to play some casual games, I think there are quite a few hits here as well. They've got like a Hello Kitty version of Animal Crossing, for example, if that was something you wanted to try out. Now, surprisingly, my favorite way to play games through a subscription service on iPhone has nothing to do with Apple Arcade, but it's actually a sleeper hit from Netflix. Over the past couple years, they've been slowly releasing a bunch of games over the App Store as well as Google Play Store for Netflix subscribers. And it just so happens that most of the best games are available on Apple and often not on Google Play Store. Now, in addition to your typical like tie-in TV and movie games, there are a bunch of ports of classic and indie PC games that are really well worth it. And so if you already do have a Netflix subscription, then I think this is just icing on the cake. It's a really neat feature. And so during my testing, I did go through and try out a bunch of these games. Most of these I had played before. I already own them on Steam but there's something unique and special about also being able to just install them directly on your phone. Not only that, most of these also have cloud saving as well, so it allows you to kind of pick up and play, same thing like you would expect when playing these on Steam. Probably one of my favorite additions includes Hades. This is one of my favorite PC games. I also like to play it on Switch, and so it's just an extra bonus that I can also play it on my iPhone. Sadly, this is one of those games that's only on iOS and not on the Google Play Store. Other games I've really enjoyed include the PS2 Grand Theft Auto games, so like Grand Theft Auto 3, Vice City, as well as San Andreas. Now again, I'm not really sure that the Netflix subscription would be worth it for the games alone, but given the fact that you would also have access to all the things that Netflix gives you, that might be worth it. And so for me personally, I definitely feel like it's worth it. Netflix is still not like the golden streaming child that it was 10 years ago, but it still provides a valuable service for me and my family. And again, being able to play these games on top of it is a pretty nice bonus. Now, one thing I've also noticed in my week of testing or so with this controller and all these iPhone games is that having Apple Arcade, as well as these Netflix games, has kind of muddied the waters when it comes to choosing which game you want to play. A great example is the fact that there are now three different versions of Dead Cells on the App Store alone. There's a $9 version you can buy just directly in the App Store if you want to own it outright, but then also there's a version called Dead Cells Plus on Apple Arcade, and then also a Dead Cells Netflix edition. And I'm not really sure which one you're supposed to play and enjoy. I personally have been using the Netflix version just because of cloud saves and all that, but I don't know, like it just makes things really complicated. The way I see it, based on the type of games that I like to play and the fact that it basically comes free with my Netflix subscription, I've been playing more Netflix games than anything else. And so even though it does muddy the waters in terms of where to find your games and whether or not you actually own them, I do really appreciate having this added bonus system. And as long as they keep pumping out games like this, it does make me more apt to remain being a Netflix subscriber. Whether or not it's actually worth picking up Netflix for the games alone is definitely going to be up to you. Okay, moving on from the App Store, let's talk about emulation. We'll start with RetroArch. Again, I made a whole guide about this, so I don't want to go too deep into it, but I still did test it with this controller. Now, the first thing I noticed right off the bat when I first started testing everything is that I had quite a bit of input lag when trying RetroArch. 
This is the kind of thing we used to see with Bluetooth, you know, maybe three or four years ago, but not very common today, so I was really puzzled by this. At first I thought it might have been a RetroArch issue, and that's what was causing the delay, but then I tried it with a Backbone controller and I had no delay whatsoever. So I was kind of confused for a minute, but then I did a couple things. I restarted my phone a couple times and then also turned off the controller, unpaired it, and then repaired it. And after that I had no other issues for the rest of the week, but it is something I wanted to note in case you do run into any input lag. Of note, when it comes to input lag, I'm not the best judge of this. I can definitely tell when it's happening, but when it's something that's kind of minor, I don't really notice. And I would say in this case, you know, even when playing over a Bluetooth connection, which is inherently slower, I still thought it was pretty good. One thing worth noting, in the next version of iOS, which should be coming out later this year, they're having something introduced called Game Mode. And essentially what this means is if you turn this on, when you start playing a game, it's going to double the Bluetooth polling rate for your controller. And this means that it should be even more responsive than it is right now. I think that's a pretty cool move, and I'm excited to try this out when it does release later this year. Now, in addition to testing RetroArch, I also tried out the Delta emulator, which is a Nintendo-focused emulator, and yeah, this one played just fine as well. When I first paired it, I did have to remap the buttons, but I think that's because I had mapped it to a different controller previously, and so I just had to change my settings within the app. Either way, yes, Delta worked just fine, same thing with RetroArch. Another emulator I want to talk about is PPSSPP. This is the PlayStation Portable emulator, and it's also been approved for the App Store. And once you have your games loaded up, it's a really simple process. I even played everything at a 4X or a 1080p resolution and all the games were playing at full speed, no problem whatsoever. Now sadly, this is about where emulation caps out on iOS, and that's not because of the performance of the chip, but because of some inherent limitations within the iOS ecosystem. And so unfortunately, because of that, we don't have the ability to, for example, play Nintendo GameCubes on a non-jailbroken iOS device. Either way, if you do like playing PlayStation Portable games, it's pretty awesome and be able to play them on here. Okay, last thing I wanted to test is a little bit of game streaming. So I already did some local remote play and some earlier footage when I was playing Destiny 2, and this is over the Xbox Series S in the studio and just using like local remote play. And so because this is just playing over the same network, yeah, no problem here whatsoever. I can connect instantly and all the games run fine. Now this controller is supported by the official PlayStation Remote Play app, so you don't have to use a third-party app, it all works fine. However, my PlayStation 5 is at home, which means that I have to remote play over the internet to actually play the game in the studio. Now unfortunately, the internet in Hawaii is pretty slow and has a high ping, and so unfortunately, it's just not a really fun way to play games over the internet, and so I did get quite a bit of lag here when playing PS5. However, when playing it within my home network back at home, absolutely no problem. So I think if you want to use this controller for streaming, it's going to be a great fit. Okay, so I think that's about it when it comes to both this controller as well as just gaming on iPhone. And I think we should wrap things up by talking a little bit more about the controller and what I like and what I don't like about it. As always, we'll start with what I like. And number one here really can't be overstated, but this is a very comfortable controller. It has full-size analog sticks, a really good D-pad, the buttons and triggers, everything feels really good. I also think that the ergonomics are really well designed, especially when it comes to playing more modern games. One of the benefits of it being a Bluetooth controller means that you can use it with a case. Unlike with the other ones where you often will have to take your case off first, this one can just be plopped right into the controller and you can start playing from there. I also like that they have a very simple app and it's totally free, no subscription or anything else like that. I can go in, I can adjust all my buttons as I'd like, and even make per game profiles. And the best thing about that is that after I've set everything up, I don't have to use the app at all. Everything else can just be used within the phone. I also think that this controller has a decent amount of battery life, about 16 hours altogether, which I think is pretty good for a Bluetooth controller. And then finally, I just want to go back to that whole design thing because I think this is a very solid controller overall. Compared to other controllers at this $99 price point, like the Razer Kishi as well as Backbone 1, I find this to be a lot more sturdy as well as premium. But of course, like with everything, this controller is not perfect, so let's talk about some of the things I didn't really like about it. The first are just some of the inherent shortcomings that come with a Bluetooth controller. The first is that you may have some input latency depending on how everything interacts with your phone, but then also you don't have the ability to do any pass-through charging, which means that your phone's battery is definitely going to drain while using this controller. In addition, this controller has a battery of its own, which means it's just an additional thing that you will have to charge. And so even though it is pretty nice to have a wireless Bluetooth connection where you can use your case, it still is something worth noting is that there are some shortcomings just inherent with this whole connection system. I also think that this controller really shines when it comes to analog stick-centered gaming. If you're going to be playing something like a competitive shooter, then it's going to be a perfect fit. 
But if you aren't, then I think that is something that you should consider. One other thing that's a little bit of a nitpick is that the controller itself is a little smudgy. Now the same thing happens on the Razer Kishi and the Backbone 1, so I don't want to give it big demerits for this. And they also do offer a white color option if you don't want to see this. But for me personally, yeah, I don't like seeing this. I wish I had a white one instead of the black one. And then finally, I just find it really weird that there is no Android support for a Bluetooth controller like this. Especially when I can take just basically any other Bluetooth controller with an X input profile and use it on both Android as well as iOS with no issue. And so this leads me to think that this is not a technical issue and why it won't work with Android, but rather some sort of deal that they made with Apple and said, hey, We'll make this controller for Apple specifically, but then maybe Apple said, okay, great, but only make it for us and not Android. Either way, it's just a little bit weird that there is no Android support from a company who obviously knows how to work with both hardware and software. And so I don't know what's up here and I hope that they do implement or add Android support at some point. Because in the end, it's kind of a shame that something so good is locked within just one ecosphere as opposed to both. Because when it comes down to it, this is one of my favorite telescopic controllers that I've ever used. In fact, among Bluetooth controllers made for phones, this is easily the best one. There are a couple other telescopic ones I really like, like the GameSir G8, but yeah, this one is definitely really at that top tier. And I think for $99, especially compared to other controllers at the same price point, yeah, this one definitely justifies it. Now, as far as whether or not you wanna invest $100 to be able to play games on your iPhone, I do think that things are great, but not the best that they could be. If I had to summarize it, I would say that the iPhone is finally at a place where I can use it as a primary handheld device, for example, if I was going on a trip. For example, if all I had was an iPhone and a Netflix subscription, paying $99 for a controller to be able to play all of those games that come with all of that, I think it's well worth it. I definitely still would prefer to use a dedicated handheld, that way I'm not draining my phone's battery. But if I was going to go to the route of using a Bluetooth controller, then I think the Scuf Nomad is probably the first one I would grab. Most of the other controllers within this space will get the job done, but none of them feel as premium and well-designed as this one. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Are you an iPhone user and does this controller make a lot of sense for you? Or are you an Android user and wish that you had one of these as well? Also, if you are an iPhone user, let me know what type of games you play. Do you play the casual kind of tap and click ones? Or do you prefer to play them with a controller? And how do you play them? Through Netflix, Apple Arcade, and so on. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.